Hallelujah. He's a miracle worker. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Somebody shout, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Would you lift up that hand towards heaven in your living room, in your bedroom, your dormitory, in your office? In this room, I want you to lift up that hand. He's a keeper. You know how close God has kept you, even when we wanted to stray far from you. Lord, I thank you for putting your arms around us, around our families. Thank you for putting your arms around our houses. Thank you for keeping your hands around our minds. Thank you for keeping us when we lost ourselves. Thank you for keeping us when we couldn't find ourselves. Now, God, tonight, establish a high standard for where you want us to be. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Somebody clap your hands if you love our God. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you, our praise team. Uh, you may be seated. I want to go straight to work tonight. I've got a lot of heavy lifting uh, that I got to do, and so I want to go straight into the Word of God. I ask that you'll arm yourself with a writing instrument. I ask that you'll uh, keep your Bibles ajar. There are several uh, scriptural references that I want to underscore and highlight uh, on this night. I uh, began a series uh, on uh, last Sunday uh, on extra, uh, that your season of the bare minimal is coming to an end, uh, but that God is about to unleash lavish blessings on the children of God. I want everybody in this room, would you declare out loud just one word, extra? extra. Hallelujah. Can you imagine that you're going to have more, you're going to have extra to live off of? Hallelujah. That the end of every pay period, you'll have extra uh, reserved in the bank. And uh, it is not limited to that which is tangible, uh, but even in the realm of uh, that which is uh, spiritual. I uh, want to uh, draw your attention uh, to Judges, Old Testament uh, book of Judges, chapter 14. Judges, chapter 14, verse 19. Judges 14, verse 19. Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything, and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home. I, I want to uh, teach tonight using as a subject, it may not look like much. It may not look like much. It is amazing that it was about uh, 50 years ago uh, that uh, General Mills found itself uh, at a halt in uh, uh, the, the benchmark or the cornerstone of their industry uh, for General Mills was uh, producing cereal. And uh, their number one cereal at the time uh, was uh, cornflakes. Uh, and this comes uh, at the end of uh, World War II uh, and uh, it's not uh, selling like they would have desired. It used to be the staple uh, in the homes of uh, every working class uh, American uh, had uh, cornflakes. Uh, but what was uh, taking place, because they're right on uh, the other side of uh, the Great Depression, uh, is people feel as if uh, it is an expenditure, it is a stretch to get cornflakes uh, because you always had to add something to it. And so as a consequence, General Mills in a closed door uh, retreat uh, came up with uh, what if uh, we put the sugar on it ourselves? Uh, and they uh, came up with Frosted Flakes. Uh, it is amazing then that Frosted Flakes and Corn Flakes are the exact same cereal. It just has something on it. Right. Uh, and if you are not discerning, you will think it's two different things. Uh, as a consequence, cornflakes, hear this, is ordinary. Frosted flakes is extraordinary. And the only thing that makes it extraordinary is what is added on it. Uh, those of us who are anointed, we are called of God, we are yielded to God. Hear this, we are, uh, in the words of John Legend, just ordinary people. 
uh, what makes us extraordinary is what is added on us. It's just a thin coat that is altogether different uh, than what regular people have. Uh, and the mistake that we make is presuming, albeit falsely, uh, that we are better when we are not better, we are just extra. Uh, so when people call you extra, they mean it as a slight uh, and don't even realize it is an acknowledgement that you realize that there is a layer or a coat on me uh, that other people do not possess. Uh, the text that we've uh, unpacked tonight uh, gives us a little bit about uh, the life of Samson and uh, I want to look at it from a uh, completely different uh, approach than what it is that uh, you have known Samson to be and do uh, or to achieve. In Judges chapter 14, uh, I want you to uh, really study it when you get home. You'll notice something that uh, uh, Samson is, the Bible uses the language, is on his way down to Timnah. Uh, it is uh, in the lower level. It's in the doldrums or uh, what sociologists would say is in the projects. Uh, he's on the other side of the tracks. He's going down to Timnah, and he is not sightseeing. The Bible says he's going down to Timnah to look for a mate. Now, this is so important because uh, we hopscotch over it. Isn't it amazing? He has a call. He has an assignment. He is under covenant, but he intentionally is going to look for a woman who doesn't have his standard. He is going to find it somebody, here it is, who will not hold him accountable to his calling. As a consequence, the parents haven't even met the girl. And they say, can't you find anybody who goes to church? You, you can't find anybody who recognizes covenant. You can't find anybody who honors a vow. And here it is, he is on his way down. And the Bible says that on his way down to go find a woman that will mess up his life, the Bible says that a lion meets him on the path. I wish I had time to talk about the lion of Judah uh, and how when you're on your way to the wrong person, uh, how it is that God will send up flares and barriers to send you uh, in the opposite direction. But what I wanted you to note uh, is what happens here. It is the activation of Samson's anointing. Uh, the Bible uses three times in one chapter, Judges chapter 14, and the spirit of the Lord fell on Samson. And when the spirit of the Lord falls on Samson, then he's able to destroy the lion with his bare hands. This is the very first time we see the execution of his anointing. The very first time we see exploits of his gift is, watch this in sequential order, the power of God falls on him. And the moment that the power of God falls on him is when he can contend, when he can wrestle, when he can fight with the lion. Ladies and gentlemen, it happens three times in one chapter. He is ordinary until the power falls. And then as soon as the assignment is over, the oil or the power then comes back off of him. He goes right back to being ordinary three times in one chapter. He does not stay in the anointing. He doesn't stay in the power. He doesn't live in the grace. As soon as he has completed the assignment, he goes back to carnality. That the oil comes on him for one express reason and that is to save his life. It comes on him. Here's what I need you to say. The power of God falls on him. A lot of you are not going to like it. The power of God falls on him while he's in the midst of doing wrong. Y'all don't like this here. This is not after a season of consecration. This is not after praise and worship. In route to the wrong person. God help me. The power of God falls on him. Not blind to his disobedience. But safeguarding his gift in spite of his disobedience. 
So he does not have the room or the dexterity to operate in arrogance because the power of God falls on him to save him when it has the marketplace to kill him. It is in the moment where God should have snatched him that God endues him with power. Unless we become arrogant, I want to go a different way than probably than what you would assume, uh, is that the anointing for the extraordinary, the anointing for the extraordinary is not reserved for people under covenant. The anointing for the extraordinary, here it is, is not limited to those who have a prayer life. And God has to prove it to us. And uh, I really labored about sharing this with you tonight. Uh, he had to prove it uh, to us to show you that he does not just release the extraordinary on people. He doesn't just put the extraordinary on people. He can put it on uh, cornflakes. All right, y'all are lost. Uh, and so it is my attempt, albeit feebly, uh, tonight uh, to show you where God applies the extraordinary uh, and how it is that we ought to look through our own vantage point of the humility of God selecting us. The very first time we see God uh, use uh, the extraordinary, here it is, and it is not on a person, is in Exodus chapter 4. I want you to go there for me. Exodus chapter 4, uh, verses 2 through 4, uh, you'll find this. Then the Lord said to Moses, he says to Moses, watch this, what is in your hand? He said, what is in your hand? Watch this, cast it to the ground and watch it turn into a serpent. Hear this. He didn't transform Moses. He transformed what he held. Hear this, the staff, hear this ladies and gentlemen, the staff is a stick. The Lord released an extraordinary anointing on a stick, not on Moses. God, y'all don't like this. So I can find no place in sacred text where he unleashed a valve of oil on Moses. He put it on the stick. So every time Moses went to perform a miracle, the stick was needed. He gets to the edge of the Red Sea and says, where do we go from here? And the Lord says to him what he says in Exodus chapter 4, what's in your hand? And when Moses lifts up the rod, what happens? The Red Sea is parted. You remember when it is that he becomes fatigued, Moses does. And he sends Joshua and Nun and says, lift up his hands. As long as their hands are lifted, they are going to have victory. You remember when Pharaoh sends wizards and sorcerers to contend against Moses. And they threw their stick down. Because here it is, Satan can use inanimate objects. He says they threw their sticks down and their sticks became uh, snakes. But the Lord says, my anointing is greater than theirs. Throw your stick down and it will consume theirs. The extraordinary anointing is not limited to people. Uh, Y'all don't like it. So let's go to Joshua chapter 6. Uh, Joshua chapter 6 uh, says something uh, around the orbit of verses 3 through 5. In Joshua chapter 6, uh, 3 uh, through 5, he says, uh, March around the city once with all the armed men. Uh, do it for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets and ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times when the priests blow the trumpets. When you hear the sound of a long blast on trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse. I need you to see this. The men who are in the army mimic the sound of the ram horn. It is not the other way around. So the horn is to blow and then the people are to shout, Tiffany, in the same key as the horn. 
behind. Now, this is the same ram's horn. Here it is. You remember when Abraham uh, went to go uh, sacrifice his son Isaac, uh, that there is a ram in the bush. A theologian suggests in order for the ram to be untangled from the bush, what do they have to do is cut off his horns. So they cut off that horn as a remembrance that this is how I got the victory. They blow in that same horn. I wish I had Bible readers here to signal that the one who was supposed to die is living because of the sacrifice. And there is a sound that comes with sacrifice. So the anointing of the ram's horn, here it is, had enough power to make walls fall down. Y'all don't read the Bible? Can I remind you of a guy by the name of Samuel? Samuel was told, go to Jesse's house. And when you go to Jesse's house, line up all of the sons. One of them will become the king of Israel. He pulls out that ram's horn, puts it over the heads of the sons from oldest to youngest. Here it is. But the oil will not flow. But Samuel said, my GPS cannot be wrong. This is the address that I was told. Don't you have another son? They said, we got another son, but you don't want him. I know you don't think I want him, but bring him from outside. And when they put him on his knees, the oil begins to flow. All that time, the oil was in it, but it would not flow for just anybody. I need you to know the oil is discerning. The oil will not go for people who look the best. It will not be for the people who are the most educated. But it is reserved for those who are chosen against popular opinion. You ought to thank God that the oil is still flowing. Here it is. And so the man of God was not anointed by a person. It was anointed by the horn of a ram. And that's where the oil is getting ready to flow. Can I tell you? There is no oil in rams. But God had to put the oil in it that these two things should not be able to coexist. And maybe you missed it that there is a hole at one end of the horn and there is a hole at the other end. The oil should have slipped out. But because it was reserved for the assignment on my life, the oil is still flowing. I dare somebody to shout out loud. The oil is still flowing. All right. So he will use a stick. He'll use a horn. Let's go back to Judges. Go to Judges chapter 15. In Judges chapter 15, something peculiar happens that I wanted to alert you of. I, what happens is that uh, uh, Samson is about to be pummeled. He's about to be destroyed. He's about to be uh, vanquished uh, by his enemies. Uh, but I need you to see what happens. He's looking around, looking for a weapon. He can't find a knife, can't find a spear, can't find a javelin, javelin, cannot find a shield. And while he's looking around, all he can find is a jawbone. <laughs> he picks up the jawbone. Here it is that is already, is already decaying and God then anoints what is decaying as a weapon. Did, did y'all hear what I just said? God puts something extraordinary, hear this, on something dead. Oh my God. He puts something extraordinary on what can no longer speak. Now you understand the power of life and death is in the tongue. Uh, that whatever you declare, it has got to come to pass. Uh, why would God anoint a dead mouth? Oh my God. He'll announce a dead mouth because he will revitalize prophecies that have gone before you that have got to be revitalized. God, I wish I had Bible readers right here. And so he picks up that weapon and now begins to sling the mouth of something that can no longer speak. Sometimes when you operate in apostolic authority, it is not based off of fresh revelation. It is based off of a word that has already been spoken. You don't even understand the warfare you have won, not from new rhema, but over a word your mother gave you. 
over a word your grandmother gave you and based off of that you were able to get the victory I don't know where y'all are because y'all are new saints but you don't know the days I was able to keep myself together over a old word God gave me over something I had to bring back to my remembrance and the anointing hear this was on a dead jaw he says I'll put something extraordinary in something that is dead and something that can no longer speak all right uh, would you go to second Kings chapter 4 second Kings chapter 4 I got to show you this uh, the wife of a man, I'm in verses 1 through 7. I'm a hopscotch around it. Uh, the wife of a man uh, cries out to Elisha, I need you to come quick. I need you to come quick because the creditors are coming. The man that I was married to who was a servant of God, worked at the local church, has died, but he has not left me in a state. As a consequence, they are coming to collect my two sons. The prophet Elisha says to this widow woman, what do you have? Says, all I have is a small vial of oil. Says, go to all of your neighbors, borrow all of the containers, not a few. Get all of them that is available in the community, then shut the door. Says, I am getting ready to bless you behind closed doors. Says, the only thing I need you to do, here this is, all I need you to do is just keep pouring the oil. And when you keep pouring the oil, here it is, the oil will keep flowing. What is significant that I cannot afford for you to ignore is that they ran out of jars. Here it is. They ran out of jars and only at the running out of jars did the oil stop flowing. So there was nothing wrong with the oil. The capacity was limited on what they borrowed. As long as they had open and available vessels, the oil would keep flowing. But when there was nothing for it to go into, then the oil would be cut off. Here it is. So the oil is operating in the extraordinary of discernment. That the oil knew I cannot flow until I find something empty. All right, that is in the Old Testament. Come with me to John chapter 2. In John chapter 2, Jesus shows up at a wedding in Cana. His mother comes over to him and says, we got a problem. They have run out of wine. He says, woman, don't worry me with this. My appointed hour has not come. She then turns around, says to the catering staff, whatever he tells you to do, then just do that. Watch the language of the master. The master said, bring, here it is, the empty cisterns. The New International Version says, bring the empty water pots and fill them to the rim. But watch the language and the directive of Jesus. I am only going to fill vessels that are empty. Here it is. If there is something in them, I don't want it. I only want those that are absolutely empty so that when I feel it, you'll know that it's me. Yet yeah, th This is too much for a Tuesday. Can I tell you that when you are at your empty place, that's when God begins to fill you. As long as you got your own opinion, got your own issue, got your own bucket list, God says, I can't use you. But when you get to the place where you're empty, God will say, let me fill you. Now, you got to understand what he said, fill the emptiness with, fill it with water. Water is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. Here it is. You understand that when there was darkness, I'm in Genesis chapter one, when darkness covered the earth and he saw nothing, the first thing that began to move was water. You remember in John chapter three, when Jesus is baptized, up by John he said this is my son in whom I'm well pleased here it is and heaven begin to open up you remember when it is that God says I'm tired of the earth operating in a place of a reprobate state I'm going to fill it with water here it is he says I've got to baptize the whole earth so when he filled the empty cistern he says I got to fill this room with the Holy Ghost but the transformation is signed and wonders I move it from water to wine which is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit which is joy 
See, you can have the Holy Ghost, but if you ain't been transformed, you will be empty and depressed. But I know that the Holy Ghost is working in me when joy comes to me when I should be empty. So the water is filled with the Holy Ghost and transforms into wine. Says, do you have anything? Shuts the door with the sons, and the oil stops flowing only when there is no containers. I'm taking you somewhere. Hear this. So the oil becomes extraordinary. I got to show you one last one. Let's go to Mark chapter 6. I'm in verse 33 through 40. Jesus has been teaching all day, and the Bible says that the sun is beginning to go down. The disciples say, Master, there are 5,000 here. What should we do with them but send them away? Jesus responds. I'm somewhere around verse number 38. He says, uh, what do you have? They said, we don't have anything, but we found a lad, and he's got two fish and five loaves of bread. Watch what Jesus does. Jesus takes the fish. He takes the bread and lifts it up and gives thanks unto it. He begins to bless it, break it, and give it away. Here it is. He does not anoint the disciples. Mm. He puts the extraordinary on bread and makes bread multiply. And when he finishes doing that, he then releases the extraordinary on fish and makes the fish multiply because he's sending us a subliminal message that the extraordinary is not reserved for people. It is connected to people who serve me. And when they serve me, I'll do something on the stuff they use. All right, come on, educators. Let's do a quick review and remember. So the extraordinary God will put on a stick. The extraordinary God will put on oil. The extraordinary, he'll put on two fish and five loaves of bread. The extraordinary, he'll put on somebody who is not consecrated. So the way my faith is set up is I need God to put the extraordinary on my money. What do you have? All I got is a paycheck that comes every two weeks. God says, what me put extra on an ordinary pay period? And I'll begin to do, here's your shout, exceedingly. I'll do abundantly. I'll do beyond what you can think, what you can dream, or what you can imagine. The extraordinary is not reserved for people. It is used for people who are being used by him. All right, let me see if I can help you. God then will release the extraordinary on cars. Hallelujah. To make sure your car doesn't break down. Even when you haven't had the oil change. Y'all ain't saying nothing. He'll release the extraordinary on houses. Even though you haven't done the maintenance, he won't let the roof collapse and won't let the basement flood. Y'all ain't saying nothing in here. He'll release the extraordinary on computers. It'll break down, but it'll save every document you need in order for you to get to the next level. I need you to just look down your row and tell your neighbor, everything attached to me is extraordinary extraordinary if it wasn't extraordinary it would have broke down by now it would have been repossessed by now it would have foreclosed by now it would have fallen apart by now but if God will bless a rock if God will bless a fish if God will bless a stick what you think he gonna do when he puts the anointing on me there's something extraordinary on your life look at your neighbor say don't treat me regular you don't know the anointing that God had even when I was going down he put the anointing on me even when I made bad decisions he put anointing on me it's, uh, it's not oh my God oh my God hallelujah I don't know where you are, but if you know there's something extraordinary on your life, I dare you to open up your mouth. Come on, you ain't regular. You ain't running the mill. You ain't like everybody else. While you were in your mother's womb, he had plans for you. 
It's about to do something extraordinary in your life. I want you to lift up that hand. God stirred something in me that made me realize in all of my days, I never prayed for what I had until it was getting ready to break. I'll never pray about my car till I see the gas light. <laughs> Y'all ain't saying <laughs> I'll never pray about it till I see the engine light. But for those of you who got lifted hands, God says, watch what I'm getting ready to do in this season of extra. I'm getting ready to put something extraordinary on whatever's connected to you. Oh my God. Did you hear what I just said? I don't care what happens. That job can't release you. Not right now. It's something extraordinary that's on your life. I pray over every lifted hand that whatever is attached to your name, God is giving it an extended warranty. Whatever is connected to you, it will not break down. It will not fall apart. It will not rust out. That God right now in this worship encounter is putting something extraordinary on what looks regular. And I pray in the name of Jesus that God will anoint those of us. I speak in inclusive language. I pray that God will anoint us with something extraordinary. Even while we were making bad decisions. Even while we were heading in the wrong direction. Even while we were entertaining the wrong people. Even while we were hanging with the wrong crowd. God, turn us tonight from cornflakes to frosted flakes. I just need an extra code of the anointing on my life. <laughs> you ain't got to do a whole lot. Just give me a layer of your anointing to help catapult me into my necks. Those of you, your faith comes into agreement for extraordinary connections. Would you give God glory for it even right now? Come on, I said, would you give God glory for it? I can't believe y'all ain't going to shout. I said, give God glory. The extraordinary connections. I am uh, thankful unto God. Would you stand to your feet? I'm thankful unto God that uh, looks are deceiving. Man looks at the outer appearance, but it's God that looks at the heart. Hallelujah. I'm telling you that, that the revealed manifested glory over your life is getting ready to peek through because you have handled yourself too regular. You were never supposed to fit in. You were never supposed to be in that circle. You'll never be a part of that crowd. You'll never be accepted into that clique because they can see that you are frosted flakes. <laughs> they, they, they don't know what it is about you the more you try to go to the back God pulls you to the front if you know I'm talking about you would you give God glory even now come on I dare you give God glory I don't know where you are I don't know who you are but I need you to stand uh, to your feet. What an amazing privilege I have uh, to serve as your pastor. I'm telling you. Uh, David put it this way in the Psalms. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you will create me just a little bit lower than the angels. Jesus goes on in the book of Luke and says, have you considered the lilies of the field? Have you looked at the birds in the air? How much more do you think I am taking care of you. Give no thought about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or the clothes that you are going to wear. When you get there, I have already made provision over your life. I don't want you to become so spoiled and so um, comfortable that you have forgotten that uh, every day God is producing fresh manna. Every day he's making sure you got clothes on your back. Every day he's making sure that your children are eating. Every day, he's making sure that there's shelter over your head. Please don't take it lightly. Don't take it for granted. 
you got extraordinary all around you and you didn't even recognize it. Can you imagine all the weight you done gained and you still fit them clothes? Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, <laughs> y'all better thank God for a little stuff. Huh? No way in the world, the way your ankles are built that you were able to get in them heels. It's extraordinary. You was able to walk here and you didn't twist your ankle. It's, it's extraordinary. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, <laughs> what an extraordinary gift. It's an extraordinary gift. Isn't it amazing the way your temperament, the way your attitude is, that you still have friends? Can you believe it? Don't take it lightly. Can you believe there are people who want to be around you? People that enjoy your company. Can you imagine? You got more than three text messages today. And some people never get a call. Nobody ever reaches out. Nobody ever checks on them. Can you imagine all the emails that you got to respond to? And some people wish that there was a call on their gift. It's extraordinary. After all of these years, all of the craziness that you dated, you ain't had to change your number. It's extraordinary. You got, you got the same phone number after the pandemic. It's extraordinary. <laughs> We're grateful under God. What is all the more extraordinary is that uh, 39 years ago, God birthed a church called New Birth, knowing you were going to need it. It's extraordinary that God knew with all the chinks in the armor, with all the frailties, with all of the misgivings, with all of the trauma, with all of the church hurt, that God still had a church designed for you. It's extraordinary. I want you to, uh, to think if God can anoint a stick, he can anoint a rock, can anoint bread, can anoint oil, can anoint water, that God anointed you for this moment. And he anointed you to be a part of this church. I want you. This is the best. I'm telling you. I got to tell you straight up and down. This is the easiest way to join the church. You can join it online. You ain't got to walk down in front of nobody. You ain't got to hug strangers. You ain't got to shake nobody's hand. You can go right now online and join newbirth.org. Our prayer partners are standing by. They want to partner with you uh, so that you can uh, become a part of our community. Become a part of our family. Be a part of uh, this circle of trust in a circle of love. If you believe that New Birth is the best church for the people who are watching, would you give God glory for them even now? Come on, you can do better than that. It's the best church for the people who are watching. How many of you were blessed by the word of God today? Come on, wave that hand if you know something extraordinary is going to be attached to your life. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, might I implore you tonight I might I ask you to join me. I need you to jump up a little bit higher tonight. Uh, can I implore you to uh, give a seat as close to $50 as you possibly can? $50 as, as close to it as you possibly can. Whether it's on GiveLify, PushPay, Zelle, or text to give uh, I want you to do that. I'm telling you that God is going to anoint your income. He's going to anoint your salary. He's going to anoint your savings account. He's going to put something extra in your checking. I'm telling you, be on the lookout. A cash app is coming any day now. A zeal is getting ready to come. I'm telling you, be prepared for a wire transfer. God is going to do it. Something extraordinary is getting ready to happen. I don't know how your faith is built, uh, but God can set you up for you to make more money in the last quarter of the year than you have made all year. Our God is absolutely able you don't have 50, I want you to get as close to it as you possibly can. All of our giving platforms are beneath me, uh, but I want you to reach even above what it is that I have uh, asked of you uh, on this day. I, I am uh, excited because I serve a, uh, a God who is a healer. Did y'all hear what I just said? I serve a God who is a healer. Uh, this is uh, our Pink Sunday Breast Cancer Awareness. We're inviting our entire church to come out uh, in pink, different shades of pink, uh, pink and black, pink and gray, pink and white. 
uh, pink and red, whatever it is that you got, pink lipstick, come on, whatever, pink fingernail polish, whatever you got. Uh, but we want to just stand in solidarity with our overcomers. Immediately after service is our Cancer Thrivers Market. Our Cancer Thrivers Market uh, is Sunday. Uh, immediately after service, I want you to come and participate and be a part of it. Uh, next uh, Tuesday, I've got a treat for you, a very special treat uh, that I want you to be a part of. I need you to come. I want you to bring uh, your family with you. Uh, one of uh, my precious daughters is going to be here, uh, Pinky Cole, who is uh, the founder of Slutty Vegan. Uh, she is a part of our church. Uh, I preached uh, a sermon many years ago. A lot of people in the body of Christ uh, were introduced to me from uh, one sermon at Megafest uh, entitled, I Hope You Fail. Uh, and uh, from that sermon, she wrote an entire book uh, that really gives a, a compass about her life's journey. Uh, that book is released on next Tuesday. It is released on next Tuesday, and we're positioning her to get on the New York Times. She's a part of our new birth family. Uh, and so I am going to be interviewing her on uh, next Tuesday. Uh, we're going to have a book signing immediately after group therapy, uh, and then lined around uh, our sanctuary will be slutty vegan food trucks. So I want you to come uh, and just hang out and celebrate. Let's fellowship uh, and be one of uh, with another. Uh, if you love our God and you're expecting extraordinary things to happen, would you clap your hands even right now? I'm telling you, you can't miss a Sunday at New Birth. Uh, something uh, always is uh, bound to take place. Last Sunday, uh, we had uh, the whole Get Fresh crew from Montgomery came and uh, hung out with us. Uh, this Sunday, we've got uh, a choir that is uh, flying all the way in from Nassau, Bahamas uh, to help. We're going to have island worship on Sunday. Uh, it's going to be amazing. I'm t that's all I'm going to tell you. Uh, it, I'm telling you, bring your shouting and your dancing shoes uh, because Sunday is going to be one for uh, the books. Uh, it is our hope. It is our aim. It is our prayer that on November 11th, we're going to raise one million dollars above tithes and offerings. One million dollars above tithes and offerings. Uh, and so we're asking every member of our ministry, every partner of our congregation uh, that you will aspire to uh, giving a seed of 1,350, 350, uh, 35, or something else. I can't even remember all the different numbers, uh, but we want to uh, help uh, build up our many homes, build up our museum, uh, build up our medical clinic, uh, and we need one billion dollars to do it. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a small thing Thing to a grasshopper. Our God is so much bigger uh, than one million dollars, but I believe if we collectively put our hearts and our minds in it, uh, that we're going to be able to do it. Your pastor loves you. I've been praying for you all day. Would you lift up those hands towards heaven? God, thank you for making us extraordinary. Thank you for what you put on our lives. <laughs>